location that he had already determined would be best for his words to sound out or to be heard by those who were about him. It says that in Matthew chapter 5 that we tend to call this place and location where he gave his message the Sermon on the Mount. And it's interesting because in Jewish culture it would be kind of hard to call it a sermon, but the point being is that because it's popular to describe it as a sermon, we learn a lot from it by just looking at the teachings that Jesus gave there because they were so revolutionary and so different than anything the people had ever heard. They marveled at what he had to say. Even today, to this day, always whenever you define Christianity and you look at what Jesus taught, most people will always point to some portion of the quote-unquote Sermon on the Mount. They often know the Beatitudes. Sometimes they know the teaching of to turn the other cheek, or they might know to love your enemies. And they might pick and part each little favorite section and not take the volume of it and apply it to the reality of what he is saying to each and every one of us. And we as Christians ought to know and to apply that which Jesus said, these are my sayings or these are my teachings. Because you see, as you read through chapter 5 and you go through 6 and 7, you come to the very end of it where it's an interesting statement that he makes about his own teachings. He says that those who hear these sayings of mine are likened unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock, that when the rains came and the storms fell upon it, it was standing still because it had been built upon a rock. But then he likens those who don't do what he says, that as he describes it in verse 26 of chapter 7, he says, But everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And if any of you have built a sandcastle, you already know the end of the story. It's kind of like the three pigs. You know, how the big bad wolf would come and huff and puff and blow their house down. Well, the same thing is true about sandcastles. You could use either story. But the point is this. Jesus said the person who doesn't do these sayings of mine. In other words, this wasn't just a sermon to pick and choose what parts you like and what parts you don't. This wasn't some kind of pie-in-the-sky idea where he said, oh, this is a nice theology that I'm going to separate and section off and make it into this religion that's going to be called Christianity someday, and I'm going to tell the people to give up the law and follow after grace because you can't live perfection. That isn't what he said. That isn't what he meant. We know what he said because we have it recorded for us. Because you also recognize that at the end of chapter 7 it says that the people heard and were astonished because he taught as one having authority, but not as the scribes. So if you wanted a religion, you could go with what the scribes were doing. They knew the law, they had applied the law, and they were able to decipher the law to you. Well, we have a Bible. We have the Word of God. We are able to look at it to see what God would say to us. And in the Sermon on the Mount, as we have looked through Jesus said in these devotionals that we spend a portion of the time looking at each section and each literal word that he speaks, then we've decided that God himself is speaking not only to you, but he's speaking to me. Because he called his disciples to himself, and then he spoke to them. And as he started off, he blessed them. And we, we've learned that when he says blessed, he means in the Jewish framework, in the Jewish mindset, he's making a bracha. He's making a blessing. He's using the custom of Judaism to bless the area and the person and those who hear it with an anointing from God that they should be able to understand it. Because to make a brecha, to make a blessing, was to invoke God by his Holy Spirit to come upon it, even as though they were pouring oil upon Aaron, which when Aaron had the oil of God poured upon him, that was the symbolic gesture of the Holy Spirit. But God honored it, because it wasn't just a symbolism, it was a fulfillment of the Holy Spirit pouring out upon Aaron, and he became the priest to the people in that moment that he was anointed. The same was true with the kings of Israel. As you know, when they were anointed with oil, God determined that he chose that man 
and put his seal through that action upon them because the Holy Spirit came within them. And so what Jesus is saying in these brechas, in these blessed, in these beatitudes, is he's blessing those. And as we looked at blessed are the poor and blessed are they that mourn and blessed are the meek, we're looking at blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled in verse 6. It's a brecha. It's a blessing. It's a baruch Adonai. It's as you have heard in many other Jewish customs and religions that have said that there is a way of communicating and arranging our conversation that involves God in it as opposed to resisting what God is doing in us because we're not called to be confrontational per se. We're called to bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in our mouth. And that's what Jesus does here. When he makes a brecha, he sets a pattern. He's describing and ascribing a way of life that is one of accepting what God has given to us this day and every day that we're alive. So we bless him for it. We thank him for it. We look at it with a different perspective than just simply being ruled by it or complaining about it or being lost in the circumstances as opposed to knowing who has arranged the circumstances of our life that we could give thanks for. As James has said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials and tribulations because there is a way and a perspective to look. And so when Jesus says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled you know and I know we all are aware of times that we have been wronged or we have felt that we were treated unrighteously that we were treated unfairly that we wanted justice or did we want righteousness you see there's a difference between justice and righteousness because in justice you're seeking to adapt yourself according to a certain format. In other words, you're putting yourself up to someone to decide whether or not you deserve, in a correct manner or an incorrect manner, a certain form of reward and benefit or a certain form of punishment and consequence. In physics, they like to say that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction until they get into max... Uh, maxim physio physics which is into quantum physics where there's some other rules that seem to change that but the point being this that the reality of wanting righteousness means that we want a right decision to be made for us we want to plead our cause so that we would have someone hear us someone who understands us and knows what we mean not necessarily always what we say who knows what's best for us because that's what righteousness is. It's a choice to make the right decision. And the right decision is never one that's detrimental to yourself. It's one that's beneficial to you. So righteousness, in the sense of what the term means, is a right choice. And when it's involving God, then wanting God to have our righteousness exemplified is one of just simply asking God to take control, to say, God, please, Please, give us righteousness. Give us someone who could come and see what we're going through. And in that day, at the time when Jesus spoke the words, there was Roman law. There was Roman peace. There was Roman justice. And that law and justice and autocratic authority was pre predetermined by a democratic, quote-unquote, idea ideology that came from Greek and Roman and multiculturalism that had adapted itself to cause a ruler to make a determination for the people. And that wasn't what the people were saying. The poor people and the ones who wanted righteousness, they were looking for something more than the law. They were looking for something that they remembered that their fathers had told them, that there was a loving God, that there was a Abba, a father that was greater than all who had created the world and so when they were looking and thirsting after righteousness they wanted something more than what the scribes and the pharisees kept telling them that god was and when jesus came on the same scene and said blessed are they who do hunger after righteousness he knew what they wanted he too 
likewise hungered after righteousness because we're told that when he was born, he looked forward to the cross. Why? Because it would bring a relationship again for the people to have with God the Father. He was wanting to hurry up and get on with what would make righteousness available to every man. He wanted to pursue it so that it could be accomplished in the people, so that they could go to God direct and not through the local establishment of some law or some tradition or some idea or something that sounded good, but in the long run pushed them farther away and made them feel worse than they ever felt before. Righteousness is not that. Righteousness causes you to feel blessed because when you're making right choices, there should be a reward for right choices. There should be a consequence to feeling with what we've made the right decision to do. And so Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger after it because it is going to satisfy. And when they thirsted, when they were thirsty for that, like the deer panting after the waters, so the soul pants after God. When they looked around and they saw that nothing satisfied, that there was an emptiness to all the decisions that the religious leaders had made, and that God was not with them, then they were thirsting for the living God because they had heard that he was the one who could satisfy their soul. And when your soul is at angst, when you're anxious for something to fill your thirst, when you want something more than what you can see, touch, or feel, that's your soul. And so when they thirst after righteousness, Jesus said, they shall be filled. And every man that was thirsty in the desert knew what that meant. Because in the heat of the day, to drink of the water, the cool pools that were there in Jerusalem, or even in the mountaintop as they were there experiencing Jesus' teachings, they knew what it was to be filled and to be satisfied. So when we look at blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, Jesus was exemplifying himself as that satisfaction. He was making the breath. He was telling them, you will be filled. I promise. It shall happen. It wasn't accomplished yet, but it would come. And when that righteousness did, then we are told that Jesus is the living water. He later explained that water that he would give, that no one would thirst again. And he is that righteousness that would satisfy our longing and make us complete in him. So... When you look at this brecha, when you look at this blessing, when you look at the people who are hungry and thirsting after righteousness, when you yourself think you have to do something in a political manner, or you have to do something in a civil manner, or you have to do something in a social manner, or you think that you have to do anything at all except to turn to God, then you are one of those who are thirsting after righteousness. But the best choice you could make, the only righteous choice you could make, is it one for clinging after and seeking justice? Because Jesus said, that's not what I'm giving you. But if you want to be blessed, you could seek after righteousness. And the way that you do that is to look to Jesus. And when you do, he blesses you because that's what you want is righteousness. And you shall be blessed. Blessed are they who thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Thank you.